James Ty yeah, of Rising yeah. 2. And James Ty came in and he sat down with you and he brought a notepad oh, with him God. to structure t- uh, for the match. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh no. <laughs> well, you now, nowadays, someone do that and I throw it out the window. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I was yeah. like, oh no, this is passing me by. Yeah. <laughs> but now, Japan then, obviously yeah. around this time. When did you first go out to Japan? Uh, it was May 2003. First time now this is a this, this was my dream to do this. Ne- never got there. The cl- nearest I got was a small hall in Carluke, uh, which we'll talk about later. Uh, but was this something that you aspired to as well? Yeah, I mean that was my main goal anyway. I wasn't really. I mean, I, I was a fan of American wrestling, but uh, in my mind, I always thought that I wasn't kind of extravagant enough or big enough, or, or you know what I mean, to to or, to be or gregarious enough to be an re- American wrestler. And I thought, well, Japan kind of suits me, you know, because they project it as a sport and it's all quite serious and everything. So, you know, really, ultimately, that was my that, that was my goal. So, for me to get there, obviously, I was over the moon about that, you know, at the time. And when what happened when you first went over? Did were you doing the six man tags and things? Yeah, or? I mean, like they're 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 on their tours. The majority of the shows you do a tag anyway, because obviously. Um, what they want to save the big singles matches for their big shows, which happen at the end of the tours, you know. Um, so I was doing, I was doing a mixture of everything. I, my first tour, they kind of test you. Yeah. Obviously, they want to see what you're like, and they want to know how capable you actually are. So I, they were putting me in with all sorts, putting me in with the young boys, and putting me in with the old guys. You know, guys at the peak of their career. I was doing six mans and normal tags and all sorts. That first tour was a real mixed bag. Um, it was interesting, you know, and and and. Uh, People go, oh yeah, they, you know, it's hard, and you know, they really test you. Not, but it wasn't really for me anyway. Yeah. For me, it didn't feel like they were really. Te- they, I mean, I was tested, but it was nothing that I'd never experienced before. That was yes. the thing, you know. Yeah. I didn't go out there and go, oh my god, they're killing me, you know, because they were. They're kicking the know? shit out of you, yeah. You know, they weren't, yeah. you know. Um, but that was interesting. I mean, the psychology of everything's completely different, and once you get your head around that, and the lack of selling that goes on, you're generally okay. <laughs> And what what's, what about the what about Japan itself? Mm. Is that is that a nice place to travel around? Oh yeah, I mean, love, I mean it, it's obviously a big culture shock. Everything's so different. You can't even read. You can't even attempt to read the language. You know, a lot of guys don't. Sp- you know, a lot of the country, a lot of people there don't speak English or even try to attempt to or give you any indication. They might even understand half of what you're kind of trying to say to them. <laughs> um, but I did like Japan, and and I. The fans were very, very, very accommodating, and you, you know you looked after by the promotion. They tour, you know, you're in a tour bus. They put you in hotels everywhere. Um, they arrange for people to take you out for dinner and meals, and, and you know, it's just treated as a, you know, you treated as a professional sportsman as you should be in other places in the world. Yeah, I was going to say, you know? was this a whole new meaning to professionalism? Of course, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. From, I mean, it's my first working for them was working for my first major company outside of, you know, independent promotions, really. And they put you with Scorpio out there. What was Scorpio like? I mean, Scorpio was cool. He was, uh, you know, he was the, he was the vet. He was the head foreigner. Um, he, he'd been, you know, he'd been touring Japan for years. Uh, he trained there. So he, he knew everything about the country. He knew the do's and the don'ts and, and how you should present yourself and what you should do in the ring and how to conduct yourself outside the ring. and So it, it was nice to learn from him all those sort of things. I mean, he's a really cool and, and laid-back guy as well, you know. Um, you know what some of the Americans can be like, but he had no ego about him, and uh, as long as he could do what he wanted to do, he was cool with whatever you wanted, you know. And is it true that he's got the largest penis in the Apparently world? Apparently so. I've not seen it. You've never seen no. it? You never well, actually I've heard the screams and... of some women because my hotel, Have you? <laughs> hotel room is invariably next to his. You, you, you're telling me when you got changed, you you didn't actually try and have a look just to see. Absolutely not. Why why, if that why was... try and make you feel yourself feel inadequate? Steve? Well, I, I, <laughs> but if it's the biggest in the world, as it is rumoured, you wouldn't feel in inadequate, world, would you? Yeah. Well, apparently so. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a pecker checker, but I'd have to check that out just to see if it was true or not. Well, you know, I think he's a show and not a grower, Steve. That's fine. Do you think? So? <laughs> <laughs> Let's bring this back on course. Yeah, we should do, really. <laughs> I think so, rather yeah. than rather than talking about big men's choppers, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, Noah, uh, <laughs> how did this end? Was this a TNA thing? or? Yeah, I, I mean, I basically signed with TNA. And, well, I mean, I signed with TNA in June 2008, and I still had 
a year of NOAA tours left. Um, so TNA allowed me to complete my NOAA tours. I finished up with NOAA in February 2009, and then I debuted on screen with TNA in May, uh, April 2009, May 2009, even though I'd been signed for a year. Because I had the NOAA tours, they let me finish those first before they used me. Because you did the UK tours with TNA, didn't yeah, I did you? Those, that, yeah, was, yeah. was that when you signed the contract? Mm, I'm trying to think of the timing of it, and it might be that, yeah, I, I think I did sign a contract before I did those tours. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think, actually. Yeah, I know. The timing of it was that I went over to America, I did their World X Cup in 2008, and I yep. signed the contract off the back of that, and then I did the tour. I'm sure that's how it worked, yeah. Yeah. So this was a this was a full on move to America, was it? You 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 shipped yourself out. You no, no, I didn't do that out. until 2010. No, no I, what they 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 fly me and Nick, um, they fly us in and out from England. Um, right. That whole period that we were the British invasion. In fact, even when I was the majority of the time I was exhibition champion, they fly me in and out of England because there was wow. a whole okay. deal with the volcano one, and I couldn't get there. They stripped me of the belt because of that. Um, oh, okay. But um, yeah. So I moved to... No, do t- don't skip over that. So what happened there? So tell me more. So you, let's go. You go to TNA. Yeah. Uh, how do things kick off in TNA for you? You start as a singles or you go straight into a tag no, team? No, uh, yeah, we debuted as a tag team, me and, me and Magnus, me and Nick. Yeah. British Invasion and with Rob as well, Rob Terry. Yeah. Um, and we debuted in May 2009 and then we won the tag titles in October 2009. Um, so they brought us in and gave us a push, um, put us in a program with Beer Money um, and Team 3D, or, you know, Team 3D, um, and we won the belts at the Bound for Glory that year in October 2009, um, and that carried through until uh, I want to say January 2010. We lost the belts, maybe before then. I can't remember. Around that time, anyway. Um, and then we split, and I won. And then basically for the whole of 2010, I was exhibition champion as a singles singles guy. So they really, they really. This, I mean, I I dipped in and out of mm. TNA because you was on it. Yeah. Literally, I would, yeah. you know, I would, I would look and have a look what my pal was doing. You so they were giving you a week. Don't give me that. I, I, I do. I, I, I dedicatedly sit down uh, and, and watch it. Yes, with some diazepam. Um, but no, I do. <laughs> I did. I watched it. I watched bits with you on there and watched what was going on. So you was, you was, you know, you was getting a good push on there. I remember, I remember listening to you on commentary as well at one oh, yeah, point. Oh yeah, yeah, I love doing that. You did a good job on. You did a good job, which was, uh, you know, a far cry from the chap that that it admittedly was not a good talker. Well, that's you what know, people so said, you know, but Stevie, let me get something straight here, right? Go on, you right? set me straight, people go on. People booked me for what they wanted me to do, or they thought that I was. You know what I mean? It's like, oh yeah, he's a great technical wrestler, we'll book him to do that. No one ever gave me a second thought to actually do a, you know, any kind of talking or promo or anything like that, because they didn't think that's what I did. They thought, oh, he's the guy that does technical wrestling, so that's what we'll book him for. You know, and... There's a couple of times in FWA where I have cut promos, and they're actually okay if you watch them back, you know, not to blow my own trumpet, but they're not that, no, they're hey, not that no. bad. And, and, and when I got to TNA, it was like such a relief to be finally be able to do something that was so different to what I'd always you know, done before, because that's what promoters expected of me, so that's how they booked me. That was really good for me. I thought that was, you know, that's, that, that gave me more motivation you know, to yeah. work and do the job, and... Uh, you know, it was a lot of fun, you know. Much more fun than that and doing bumps, isn't it? And, uh, oh, of course it is, yeah. <laughs> to, talking, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So the whole X Division thing, you you won that, and you held that for how long? Well, I mean, pretty much, I'm, I can't remember myself, but it was most of 2010. Um, and I, But the problem was, like, uh, I was booked for a pay-per-view. I still lived in England. They flew me in and out, yeah. They booked me for a pay-per-view in April of that year. Um, it was like a cage match, and I was defending it against... I think in a three-way, three-way cage match. You see, one gimmick's not enough. You have two gimmicks. <laughs> but, but that volcano, you know, the volcano erupting, and uh, I remember uh, well because my mother-in-law was trapped here. Yeah. So yeah. So I was trapped in England. So they they just stripped me of the pay, they stripped me of the title at the pay-per-view, um, and then when I finally got back to America, the following uh, for the following TV tapings, I, I I regained it, and we just carried on with the story, <laughs> the story oh, that okay. they actually had, but. Uh, so I'm a two-time exhibition champion, not by de- not by design, more by accident. 
Who were some of the guys that you worked with for the X Division title that you would say were stand out? That were stand out? Yeah. Oh, God. Well, I worked, I mean, like, I had a program with Shannon Moore, then I had a program with Kazarian, and then Brian Kendrick, and then Jay Lethal. And they're all kind of, you know, they're all different in their own in their own ways. Really. I mean, I probably enjoyed working with Frank, Frankie and with um, Jay Lethal the most out of, out of all the guys. Yeah. Um, and obviously, I, I did the odd matches with guys like Chris Daniels, who I'd known for years and years and years, and they were always fun. So about this time, obviously you'd be doing UK tours as well. When did the the Ric Flair match happen? Because this this was uh, pretty amazing. Tell people what happened here, because uh, you can't tell me at any point that this was an, uh, another day at the office for you. No, it was. Uh, you know, I was you know, yeah. I was well, I mean, that was just basically um, that was in their 2011 tour. Um, so. I lost the X Division belt in, I think, October 2010. Um, they started doing the whole thing. They had a stable called Fortune, which was kind of Ric Flair's stable in in, in TNA, um, which I was part of. And then I split from them, and I was feuding with them. Um, and so part of their headline, or part of, you know, for selling tickets for the UK tour, was me against Ric Flair at Wembley Arena. Uh, yeah, which was uh, January 2011. Um, and that was all off the back of the me feuding with Fortune. That, that, and that kind of ended just before that tour started. My feud finished with me wrestling AJ Styles, who's kind of the lead, the wrestling leader of Fortune. Um, and that kind of led into the into the match at Wembley. Um, which, yeah, you, you know, it, it, it is a big deal. You know, he, this is a huge name. Years of, you know, legacy behind him. Um, and you know, it's like the, the thing that interests you most is how are they actually in the ring? You know, you know, fans think they're fantastic wrestlers. You think to yourself, well, what are they actually are they amazing worker in the ring as well? Do I not have to think about anything? Will he tell me? Every, you know, and yeah. um, to be honest, to, to to you know, to be honest with you, he was it was it was it was great. We barely talked about anything. Just went in there and worked, and we had a good match. Even for a, you know, he was sixty three or whatever. The only yeah. down point of it, he, he he tore his shoulder, he tore his shoulder muscle, taking the you know the, the throw off the top turnbuckle that he always did. So we had. He's never done. I've never never seen him do that. <laughs> <laughs> Must be a new spot he's come up yeah. with. Yeah. So we had to go home early, unfortunately. But right. You know. Was, but what a what a did you ever think that when you when you started your training in Hammerlock all those years earlier that you'd be main eventing Wembley Arena with Ric Flair? Yeah, of course I did. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course not. You know, like I'm. I, it's something I preach to. Kind of preach to guys who go when I do training seminars and everything about that is like, don't set your ambitions too high. Take it in stages. You know, like this is my short-term goal. I want to be here, and then you know, m- when you reach that level, you, you, you set the next goal and you do that. So, you know, my goals when I first started was I just wanted to be regular on the British circuit and earn a little bit of money. So that way you're never disappointed. You know, if you set your goal as, oh yeah, I want to be WWE champion when you just started training, you're always going to be disappointed, aren't you? You're never going to have that motivation to to, to reach that goal because you're always going to be let down, and, and, and unless you're a, a physical freak with amazing athletic ability. Uh-huh. Yeah, <laughs> so I mean, when I started, I never even, I never even, it never even entered my mind that that match could ever take, you know, that ever happen. Um, but obviously it was a huge honour for me when it did. So when you finally moved out there, mm. like I said, you you moved out literally. You I know you moved your cats out to America and and everything else. Yeah. Um, what happened in TNA? Because I I mean, but you know, let's not beat around the bush. Yeah. You're pushed up, didn't it? Yeah, I think it was just a change of management, a change of creative direction, um, and I just wasn't seen as one of the guys that could I don't know make them any money. I suppose. Would this have been when Hogan came Pretty in? Pretty much, yeah, around that time. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty much after that UK tour, the, the tour ended, you know, that was January 2011, and then after that, I, they didn't have anything for, really for me at all, and that was it, sit at home time. Yeah. And is that what you did, you sat at home? Pretty much, yeah, well, yeah. they bring me in for the odd TV here and there, but certainly there was a three-month period where I did nothing at all. Um, they booked me on the old house show loop, but not that many, and it's clear, I mean, if you look at what happened and when it is, it was obviously a change in management and a change in direction and a change in focus. Um, and uh, they obviously didn't see me as 
as somebody they wanted to push anymore. Yeah. And then when was it you moved out to look?